Segment two, Golden Black Live, Dave Shondell, Kyle Charters, and uh, Brian Newbert's off on the side. He's going he's gonna to send us a question or just tweet every, tweet every controversial thing <laughs> Dave says. No, Dave won't say anything. Welcome to the show. As I said this morning and I've said on Twitter today, the only coach of a top 15 team in America that would come and do this show on a game day, but that's because it's how important it is. How apparently. do you know that? I just feel that. I feel that. It kind of depends that. on what's going on. I feel it's that. Not no. that much, really, I, not that much going I know, on. But there is a, a whole week to get ready. But so. there is a lot going on tonight. Obviously, yeah. uh, your team plays a very good Wisconsin uh, squad, 8 o'clock uh, at Phelan Court. And you, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to get easier in the Big Ten. You guys just, uh, every, week, every match is, uh, and teams can, and even teams that aren't ranked can be, can be dangerous on any night. Well, it's it's clear the league has gotten better and better and better pretty much every year since you know we got here almost yeah. 14 years ago. This is our 14th season, so um, it has not gotten easier. I know that, and this is probably the toughest year that the Big Ten has has had as far as the amount of teams ranked in the top 25. Currently, there are nine yeah, ranked in the amazing. top 25, and and then you've got teams like Iowa and Maryland and Northwestern and, and even Indiana, although they didn't show well here. On Saturday night, um, they came in at 12 and two. Yeah. So, um, a lot of good teams. Really, right now, Rutgers, and now they'll probably beat us. That I said <laughs> that, but Rutgers is the only team that really seems to be behind the curve of, of the other 13 teams in our league that uh, are very well supported and well coached and, and playing at a, at a pretty good level. Yeah. You need to petition the Big Ten or something and have them not have you play the second ranked and then the third ranked team, and then Nebraska coming up in a week too, right? So yeah, three of our next four against one, two, and three. Yeah, <laughs> but you're going to have to play them at some point in time. Yeah. And uh, one way, from an RPI standpoint, that's all good news. You know? Yeah, but you've got to get your share of wins also along the way. And you think if your team's good enough, that especially with two at home, mm -hmm. that you know you've got a chance to. to to win one or, or, or two of those if you play extremely well. So, um, you know, it's it, it seems, you know, like a, a major, major challenge, but uh, I think that we'll be, we'll represent ourselves very well uh, in those matches. How do you prepare your team for back-to-back, -back, I mean, essentially back-to-back -back games, and the second one's going to be, you know, as good a, a, as the first? Yeah, well, you, you prepare your team for the first one. Mm-hmm all week long and it, it used to be tougher when every Big Ten weekend was Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Now at least half of them get staggered a little bit maybe Wednesday, Saturday or, or Friday, Sunday like is the case this week. So you've got a little bit of time to do some work with your team in between but when you were playing Friday and Saturday it was real tough. I mean you were <laughs> up really you're up until three in the morning yeah. and your team was you know up until one in the morning and you're dealing with them and then you're watching more tape and then you're it was just a grind. And it really wasn't good, I didn't think, for anybody, including the athletes. And so now I like it a little bit better. But we've, we've watched a ton of tape on Wisconsin. We've put that tape in front of our, our team. We've uh, gone through the things that they do in practice, and we've de defended those things, and we've tried to score against uh, their defense. In the meantime, once you get to about Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning, coaching staff then starts to turn the page to Minnesota and starts to get a little bit ahead of the game on that so you're not being rushed in 24 hours to try to yeah. get a game plan together for, for that team who's ranked, I think, second in the country right now. <laughs> yeah, how, many, how much do they, in volleyball do teams change from a strategic standpoint? I mean, in terms of preparing for what do they typically, to, to the layperson watching, what do they do di a lot differently that you, that you see that you have to prepare for in terms of, uh, what, is it a nuanced thing, or I mean, are there definitely? I think it's it's a lineups, it starts with a personnel yeah. type thing. Um, you have players on you know, hitters on the other team that like to do certain things, shots that they like to take. It'd be like in basketball. Yeah. Does, does the post player want to go over their left shoulder, go over their right shoulder, and do you have to defend this person when they're 20 feet out, or can you back off of them? It's really similar in, in volleyball. Is you know, there are, there are certain people we're going to pay more attention to than the others. Now, yeah. against teams that we're playing this weekend, that can bite you in the butt yeah. because they're all pretty talented. And if you try to load up on, uh, on certain people and give, you know, the, the, their middle hitters a better opportunity, um, these teams are good enough to make you pay for that. So we, we just have to be really good, but we wanted to make sure our, our team is, is really prepared for each player and what shots they like to hit and what shots we're going to take away at the net, therefore, what shots we've got to dig in the backcourt. For example, if Kyle's a big left side hitter and we're going to go up and we're going to block line on him, that means we better be prepared to dig 
the angle exit, because right. that's the shot that we're giving up. And we try to take away at the net the shots they like to hit and then have our backcourt people then be prepared to, to dig. And then there are different systems. You know, these both these teams are, have really good setters that run 5-1 offenses. Yeah. That means there's one setter and, there's, and that means there's five hitters in their six-person uh, lineup. And both setters um, are very talented. One of the setters likes to be offensive, so when she's in the front row, you've got to be prepared for that element, that she may take it over on the second contact, where the other setter isn't quite as much that way, so it allows your front row people to focus then more on the actual hitters and not also trying to defend the setter while they're also then trying to go out and, and block when she sets the ball. So defensively, that's, that's one of the things you're looking for, but it, it starts with serving, and you try to go after somebody that cannot – pass the ball as well as the rest of them because if they're passing the ball to their setter on a consistent basis uh, you're going to be out of luck it's just that yeah. simple against these teams so we've got to find a way to disrupt which is what you know that's kind of what uh, my my brother john our associate yeah. head coach that's that's his deal is to um, at the end of the day have a, a serving plan that we're going to be able to take people out and if, if anybody got to see us play this year in particular last match against indiana um, you know, we took them right out of what they wanted to do. It wasn't until game three that they finally got into any kind of rhythm at all uh, with our serving that they could then start to, to have a pretty good offensive performance. So before the season, we were sort of going through some of your schedule, and you got a pretty tough non-conference and, you know, thought you were going to take your lumps during that non-conference, and then you go out and, and beat two top ten teams. So yeah. what went so well for you? Well, um, we played – really well in the, the, the two matches against the teams that were highly ranked top 10 teams we played at a high level um, I thought all along that we, we could beat Kansas at home I would not have put a lot of money on us going to Stanford, Stanford and winning and, and beating yeah. uh, them out there and they've gone on and haven't lost you know they lost one before us but they haven't lost since and, and they've had some big wins uh, along the way as a matter of fact our opponents right now are 124 and 60 on the season which is why our RPI right now is sixth in the country, despite being you know 12 and two. And uh, as you guys know, in the past, that RPI number has really hurt us. <laughs> yes, it's hurt yeah. us from not allowing us to be in the tournament two years, two years yeah, ago right. to where we had to go play Texas in the second round last year because of uh, the RPI element. So, uh, providing we get enough wins to get in the tournament this year, I think that that our RPI is going to allow us to be a tournament team. And hopefully, um, if we win the number that I think that we're capable of, that we should be in better shape than we have been in a long time in the NCAA tournament. But that's a long, long way away, and I know we've got to get some wins, and we certainly would like to pick up another big one this weekend. Yeah, we had a question about uh, your your brother, and as I said, I ran into him at the Triple X restaurant this morning with Brittany <laughs> and Kelly Sheffield, the head coach at University of Wisconsin. And I didn't, I didn't know that Kelly and John were long time, have been friends, yeah. played ball, played uh Little league together. How much do you? I mean, since you've been around the league, do you know these coaches like a, the back of the, your hand? Do they change uh, a lot? I mean, do you do you know basically what to expect coming in? Well, I think we, we know the coaches yeah. pretty well. Uh, we see them. You know, you see you don't see photos or, or video of art volleyball coaches, but you see the videos of basketball yeah. coaches at those tournaments. It's no different <laughs> yeah. than. I mean, we're there. We're You're all sitting there, and we're we're watching the same one percent. That's every every tournament that yeah. can play in the Big Ten, and so you spend a lot of time when you're out recruiting, and and you just assume like somebody is not. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be out there, <laughs> yeah. at, least like like, at least act like you do. <laughs> okay. And uh, so you, you spend a lot of time with those people and get to know them pretty well. Now, as far as how they coach, yeah, they it's not any different than a lot of you know. I'll use the basketball term again. Matt Painter's going to play man to man. Yeah. You know, no matter how hard Basil Mobby tried to get him to change to yeah. run, some, <laughs> run some two three, it, it, it happened it didn't about last long. Did. <laughs> so you know, teams are going to do certain things and coaches are going to do certain things. But these coaches in our league are without a doubt the best in the country. I mean, there's three of the coaches in our league are the highest paid coaches in in, in America, and, and they deserve it. You know, one won the Olympic medal. You know, mm -hmm. with the men's team and finished runner up with the women and. Russ Rose has won, I think, seven national championships, and John Cook now has three, and they're being well compensated as they should be. And then you got a guy like Sheffield that's been, you know, runner-up, and uh, three other coaches that have been to the Final Four. So there's a lot of really, really good coaches in there, and you better be on your toes. Uh, the, the goal is you, you like to think that you're going to maybe be able to outwork and outcoach yeah. somebody, but it doesn't really happen very often yeah. in this league. Yeah, too many good coaches. In the preseason, you liked your team's chemistry, and you know you never know exactly how that's going to show up in wins and losses, but it seems like. 
with this team, it has showed up pretty positively, right? It's just we've had some people really grow up. Yeah. Uh, I think I may have mentioned that to you early in the year even. We, we could see it. We could mm -hmm. sense it. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, players like Danielle Catino and Azaria Stahl, uh, even Sheridan Atkinson, the, the transfer from yeah. Long Beach State, um, we knew that they were really, really talented and, and they were would play really at a high level, um, you know, periodically, but you, we weren't getting that consistency and they weren't really um, – generating the kind of chemistry that that we really needed uh, in the past and then something happened between last spring and uh, this um, fall I think basically they got older mm -hmm. and they looked around and they said we are the leadership of this <laughs> yeah team. you know yeah. we're not yeah, we're not the followers and and we did some things to, to help with that you know we put them in a, in a group and we had some meetings with them and even got Kathy Wright Eager involved with that and she's kind of our leadership guru and uh, she does a terrific job with, with the athletes and so you know, we, we, we try to do some things to, to help, um, I guess, speed up that process. But um, And it's not like they're not capable of making mistakes and, and not being you know, great at that because they're college students. But I think that they, they've grown up, and, and we only have 13 players on our team. You talk about chemistry and cohesion. The less you have, I think the easier it is. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's a question we look at as we go down the road. This is as few of players as we've ever had yeah. on our team, and yet our chemistry is as good as it's ever been mm -hmm. as of right now. And uh, we haven't faced a lot of adversity yet, you know, and chemistry is always pretty good until something, you know, sticks up its ugly head. <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden you find out what you're really made out of. Yeah, yeah one note, I, I was looking at your game notes about the whole fact that you're one of three schools among 334 – I didn't know there were 334 Division One schools – to still have 1,000 on the, on the APR – Meaning that you're great academically, and does that what challenge, does that present a whole? Because even if you have bad chemistry issues, I'm not saying you've had them a lot of it over the years, but you got good kids. I mean, you have kids that are typically great students and they're interested in being students. How, does that make it more difficult or a bigger challenge just to have? Because you know these 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 women are very accomplished off the court, and you got to make them accomplished on the court. Well, I don't think we've ever had bad chemistry. Yeah. Um, but the difference between winning and losing it at this level is is very small. And so you like to have great chemistry. Yeah. That's what you're trying to have. And we work really hard at that, and so do the players. And, and uh, uh, But sometimes it, it, it does show up as if it's not being as productive as you like. But really proud of the APR, you know, for yeah, the last – Yeah, Whether they started that 12 years ago, right. that uh, we've had a perfect 1,000 score, which means that everybody that we've recruited – has graduated in five years uh, from, and not necessarily from Purdue. Yeah. You know, we've had uh, we've had four transfers in, in 14 years, um, but which is the lowest in the Big Ten, by the yeah. way. But I think that, um, you know, like I said, we're one of three schools. I think there's an Ivy League school, and maybe Northern Iowa might be the third school that uh, is in that mix. And we hope that will continue for yeah. a long time. My guess is it will, from that standpoint, the kind of caliber of. Kids, you, know, you owe you owe Wisconsin something though. It's, mm. they've, it's been five <laughs> in a row, and you don't need to be reminded of that. Though you beat Minnesota here last year, but uh, is is it something? I mean, they're, they're obviously an extremely good team, and they and you guys have been right there with them. But uh, that happens in sports sometimes. But does that provide any extra motivation for your? Did you, are the kids aware of that? Do they or only the coach aware of that kind of stuff? They're they're very much aware of of what their success has been. Uh, Wisconsin's been a great defensive team, great ball control team with the best setter in the country. And so they've been hard to beat for a lot of people. It just isn't yeah. us. I mean, they haven't lost many matches in the last two or three years. The first match of this five-match loss string that were on to them was in the Elite Eight match. Right. Um, you know, when we had a team that kind of blew up at the end of the year and, and started playing great volleyball and uh, – beat Missouri, who was number three in the country at their place, and then we beat Illinois in the Sweet 16 at their place, and then we play Wisconsin, two teams that neither one really expected themselves <laughs> to be there, yeah. and uh, and they just outlasted us in a, in a pretty good match. And then since then, you know, they've beaten us four times in a row, and only one of them has been a, been a pretty good match. Yeah. So, um, I, I, again, I think they don't give you anything. Yeah. And so if, if you know our history, we, we recruit big physical athletes, at least that's what we try to do, and with the idea we're going to develop them and shape them and turn them into really good volleyball players. And, and they've just got a, the kind of team that doesn't make many errors at all. So when you make errors, because maybe you're not as, as finesse as they might be or whatever, uh, it shows up because they're not going to give you anything. And I, I don't know. They lost their libero. 
Uh, it's the only person to graduate yeah. on their team, uh, Taylor Mori, who was first team All American, if I'm correct. And um, so I, I think that they're not quite as stellar defensively as maybe they were the past two years, but that's still their strength. And uh, you know, you know, hopefully we'll, our offense will be in system and our guys will show up and, and punch some tickets and and uh, make a difference tonight. I asked you earlier about how you get your team to move on. How do you move on from one game to the next? Because it's got to be difficult at times, especially if you lose a close one. I mean, I'm not involved, and i still stewing over the service area you had against Illinois there. Yeah. We, we, made a, we made a couple <laughs> of boneheaded plays late. Yeah. Uh, but how do you, I mean, how do you those, just well, move you know, on from if, one to the next when you have you know, such a quick turnaround? That, that really isn't, isn't that hard of a deal. Yeah. Uh, the, the hardest part for me, and you're talking – about how I feel personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, the hardest part is just the day of the game, you know, and waiting. You know, you've done yeah. really all you can pretty much do <laughs> during the course of time, and so now all you do is wait. and And you know what the ramifications are if if you win and if you lose. Right. And uh, you know, these matches are slightly different because you're playing teams that, you know, if you're going to pull America, ninety uh, percent of the people would probably say Wisconsin and, and Minnesota. Are, are supposed to win, I would, I would guess. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the part about moving on is you don't have any choice, you know, <laughs> especially this weekend. You know, you get beat. We're already – I'll be watching tape tonight, you know, as soon as the match is over, trying to get ready for, for Minnesota because now you've got to really be ready for Minnesota. If this one didn't go uh, like you, you know, alluded, it might not um, <laughs> uh, as well as, as it does. We but, didn't say but, that. Um, but you've got to move on. You, you, you hate to lose when you don't yeah. play well. And we didn't play yeah. real well against Illinois. And then I thought we came out and made up for that. Uh, and we had them ready to play against Indiana. And it'll be, you know, our coaching staff's job to uh, not only have them ready from what we've done this week, but – also send a message to them before the match to help them get uh, get fired up and be ready to go. And then that is one message I know that Dave Shondell can deliver. All right, you have a new boss in Mike Babinski. Is he a volleyball? Does he? Uh, and he's. Have you had? You obviously had a chance to talk to him. But what's been your impressions and what what what's his uh, viewpoint towards your sport? Well, I've had some real good conversations with him, and uh, he's very very likable. Yeah. Um, I think his values. Are similar to Morgan. I think that has been brought out by some people yeah. in the process, the hiring process, and in the announcement. But he's not like Morgan very much at all. I, yeah. I think Morgan, it would be fair to say, was was on the conservative side of things. And uh, I mean, I think you know my feelings on Morgan. He, yeah. he did a great job, and he hired me. So yeah, uh, <laughs> there you go. Forever. But uh, I think Mike. Bobinski is going to, as I've told people after my conversations, he's going to make stuff happen. Yeah. And I don't think that that was what you know Morgan's, you know, mo was make things happen. He yeah. was just going to make sure that we he was guiding the ship and we were moving in the right direction. And and when things needed to be done, they were going to be done. And I think this guy has a little more aggressive approach. Now he hasn't done anything yet, so I'm just telling you what, what I what, what I sense when I talk to God. I could be I could be dead wrong on it, but. Um, you know, I think that uh, he, uh, he, he knows what, what the coaches have shared with him that we think Purdue can benefit from and um, direction that we can go. I, mean, we, I, mean, I, th I think the general consensus is we don't market Purdue very well. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about Purdue athletics. I'm just talking about Purdue in general. And uh, I think that if, uh, if Mike and, and, and Mitch Daniels and the other powers at B get together and, and say that, how do we take this university to a new level? We just got ranked as the fourth best, you know, public university in America. In America, and we got a got a lot of good things going on in athletics. Why don't we get out there and start really pushing this thing so that when recruits come to Purdue, the first thing they say is, "I had no idea that Purdue was had all this." Yeah, because that's what they say. Yeah, yeah. in any sport, they come here because that we they don't. I mean, Purdue is kind of the best kept secret in America as far as a, an athletic Big Ten school. Mostly just because of the name. It's not a state name yeah. school. And so I think that, that I think what Mike uh, is willing to do is to, is to put us out there a little bit more, whatever, whatever that means. And uh, uh, I think he's got some ideas. He just hasn't put a lot into play yet. He's been gone a lot. He's either yeah. been in Big Ten office or he's been at the NCAA <clears throat> or he's been out meeting you know, some of the, the donors. And, and he's had meetings, I think, with most of our head coaches by now. And uh, but I, I really like him. I think that our people are going to really like him. 
and I think this is a, an exciting time to be at Purdue. Yeah, he, his approach towards coaches, he seems to be, his reputation is very much of a, uh, a friend of coaches and kind of gets in there and, and feels your pain and yet uh, tries to, like you said, even from people we talk to, really tries to get figure out ways that you can build things going forward. Is that the sense you've got? Well, I, I think so, and I, I would say that, that Morgan was, a, yeah. was an awfully good friend. I mean, Morgan yeah, yeah. never tried to get into, in my opinion, anybody's business and try to tell them how to coach, and he was always there uh, to give them support that, that, you know, that they needed. I think that um, what Mike thinks is important might be, you know, might be different than what Morgan thinks, and so uh, I do believe he, this is a guy that was, you know, Played baseball at Notre Dame yeah. and was in into some coaching for for a while, and, and that's that's one thing that you know we haven't had in the administration since Tom Ryder passed away, which was a couple of years yeah. ago. Uh, really, not anybody with any real coaching uh, background, and uh, and I think most of our coaches felt really good talking to Tom Ryder about things, and I think that Tom was somebody that had Morgan's ear mm-hmm. and that could go in and say, "Hey, I know what you feel about this, but let's get this done. This is something that we yeah. need." And uh, so, and, and I think that now we're kind of in another transition where you got a, a new AD, and now the art administrators are trying to figure out what their role is going to be and, and things like that. But um, I, I do think that Mike's going to make stuff happen. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the direction he goes. Will you be able to take a peek at the football game tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, I certainly plan on, on watching a 3.30 start. Is that right? 3.30? Yeah. That's right. And uh, I heard you guys talking about it. I. I don't know enough about Maryland. Uh, to, to uh, they're kind of in a similar situation yeah. that we are, except their coach is new. Yeah. And uh, um, but I, I like to think that we can we can stay in the game with those guys. It's a it's a really big game for for Purdue football. That's one of those that when you look at the at the schedule, you think, well, we, we need to get that one um, yeah. if we're going to have the kind of season that is going to put us in a bowl game. You had an unbelievable crowd in Mackey Arena after a football game last week and, and uh, the match against Indiana. Does that make you want to do, not say more matches, but just kind of work on that, uh, on that uh, momentum, so to speak, to have, the, have two or three in there a year, which you've had some over the years, obviously. But. Well, pretty much limit it to one yeah. uh, is what we've done because, really, that's basketball's yeah. facility. Yeah. And when you come in and play a volleyball match, people don't understand that that means – that all day it's your it's your building because the teams yeah. other teams have got to practice it's got to be set up for volleyball and so you're telling your basketball programs that we got this new practice facility for you you, know, yeah. you, you need to go use that <laughs> yeah. and and they don't necessarily want someone to tell them that <laughs> they, they don't mind doing it if that's what they want to do um, I don't know I, I think at times that we have to to, to look at, at maybe playing more in there if if we're going to get you know we're selling like I think both matches this weekend will be sold, sold out by the time it's done. Uh, when they start, but that's a great environment. I yeah. think we're really in a pretty good place. Yeah, that it's a great you can play one or two. You know, you might want to play one more in Mackey um, to get the numbers up. But you know, we've always been a, a top ten in the country in attendance, but we've been right there at ten yeah. because twenty five hundred is all you, all can, you can do in that building. And so um, our attendance is about twenty five hundred yeah. uh, as as an average, and, and that barely gets you into that top ten. So if you can get another one in Mackey where you can get, I mean, they said this one was eighty eighty two hundred, and I'm thinking. I'm not sure anybody counted them. I mean, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but uh, it was 80% full. Yeah. So I, I am good enough to know what 14,213 times 80% <laughs> is. Yeah. And more it's than, more than 8,200. Yeah. And so I was, I was thrilled with that crowd and the job our marketing people did to get the huge numbers in there, and they were loud, and, and they, loved, uh, they loved to see Purdue beat Indiana. Yeah, that is, a, that is a staple of Purdue fans. All right, Purdue, Wisconsin tonight, 8 p.m. As he said, I think there are still some tickets available, but you better hurry. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the Boilermakers at 1.30 uh, on Sunday against Minnesota. And uh, then Dave's going to go golfing for a couple weeks. No, that's not <laughs> true. He has got a, uh, a full plate from now until uh, hopefully a couple weeks into December for his, his team. 12, so. 12 more weeks we yeah. have to have. 12 right. more weeks. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Who's counting, though? It's just yeah. 12 more. That's yeah. right. So, hey, well, thank you so much again for thank your you. time. We Appreciate always it, enjoy it. Yeah. And uh, we will bring Brian Newbert on for segment three, talk about uh, a little basketball recruiting and basketball uh, at start of men's basketball practice as well. And we'll hit that in our final segment of Golden Black Live.